Good evening and welcome to Woman. Tonight we will be discussing the single parent experience, specifically the experience of an unmarried person who chooses to adopt a child. My guest this evening is a single parent. She is Marjorie Margolis. Marjorie is a reporter with NBC News in New York. She is currently collaborating on a book about adoption by single people and her experience as a single mother. Welcome to the show, Marjorie. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Do you think that single parents are courageous, selfish, or crazy? <laughs> um, I, I suspect a, a little bit of, of all three of those. It, um, it's hard to talk about motives with any kind of a single, uh, with any kind of a, a, a single thought or item or whatever. And, and I suspect that's what you're asking. Why does a person want to get into it? I can be fairly specific about that. What happened to me? Why I did it? I was doing reports, a series, on hard-to-place children and decided that eventually I would like to do it. Eventually, in a traditional sense, I thought I would marry and then have a couple of kids of my own and then adopt. But it turned out that <laughs> that wasn't the progression. And I certainly had the means and I had the will and I knew that I had the stamina or thought I did and um, decided to do it. I, I saw these kids who wouldn't have homes and I thought that I had always gotten along with the children, why not try and do it? And it's worked out very well. I, I wouldn't call it courageous. I uh, think it's the the most selfish thing I've ever done. Uh, I've had a wonderful, wonderful, I've had the best four years in my life. It's it is, I would suspect some psychologist would say, directed selfishness. But it's, it's really something that I've enjoyed a lot. Uh, there's a lot of craziness in it. Ask Mildred and Herbert Margolis, ask my parents, they think I'm a lunatic. <laughs> but um, it's, it's been a good experience. It certainly has been um, a maturing experience for me. You have two daughters. Yes. How old are they? One of them is 10, Lee Hay Margolis. And you adopted and, her four years ago? Oh, yes. It's easiest to say it that way. She had to be with me for a while before I formally adopted mm -hmm. her. She came here, adopted her. She came here four years ago. And the other one is Holly Margolis, who um, just arrived from Vietnam about nine months ago. And uh, both of them are, are lovely. Would you like to see them? <laughs> well, I might as well know what they look like. It's, it's, uh... Now, Lee Hai is Korean. Lee Hai is Korean. And uh, she is this little child right down here. And this is Holly, and that's the mother. Holly is Vietnamese, right? Holly is Vietnam. Holly is part Vietnamese and part, um, here's another one. Would you like to see the two of them in action? Holly is obviously a mixture of, I suspect, an American soldier and a Vietnamese woman, and Li Hay is pure Korean. How did you decide to adopt interracially? Well, when I first decided that I was going to adopt, I called a lot of agencies. And that was quite a while ago, it was six years ago, and that was something that they hadn't heard a lot about. It was in Philadelphia, and the agency was the Children's Aid Society of Pennsylvania, and they were really lovely about it. But I called a lot of other people, and everybody said no. And Private finally, adoption agencies, you just mean? Just agencies, agencies in New York, International Social Services, um, Pearl Buck, Welcome House, those people, everybody said categorically no, that they were not because handling Because you were not married. Because I was unwed, yes. Um, then I called up Children's Aid, and, and they didn't say that they wouldn't do a home study, but they were not, they, they didn't exactly know which course to proceed on. I finally got an agency, Holt. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're in Oregon, in Eugene, Oregon. And they gave me a half nod. They didn't even say yes. They said maybe. Um, and I happened to be going to the Far East. And I went and met the people at, in Holt over there. And, and they, as I was getting ready to leave, they said, we have this little girl for you. Would you like to meet her? Mm -hmm. I said. <laughs> it took me two and a half years, though, from the time that I thought of the idea from the time that the, the idea was first conceived. Until Did the agency in, in Korea respond to you similarly to the one here? 
I mean, were they a little taken aback by the fact that you weren't married and that you walked in their door and said, listen, I would like to have a child? They were, they were reasonably uh, wary, yes. They didn't know exactly what to do with a single person who was there. I stayed there for a while and did some stories on the children. I followed up the stories from the Philadelphia side. I was with the CBS station there, WCAU, and I followed the stories up that I was doing in Philadelphia because there were lots of Korean kids who were home, who were in homes in the area, and I was simply following up that story in Korea. So I was there both working and as a potential parent. So it gave me an edge because I was going around with a lot of the social workers and a lot of the people, and it gave them a chance to get to know me, and I got to know them. So it was very pleasant, and they were very nice. About were you it. able to spend time with her then? Oh, no. No, no, no. no. As a matter of fact, I, they, uh, they, told, they asked me what kind of child I wanted. Uh, and, well, I thought about it, and in a very... I suspect liberationist sense, all the consciousness raising type things came to my head. I said, well, what, what would you really say? Well, what, ideally, in our society, uh, what kids get along best? It's a cute, pretty little girl. Well, I just, I wasn't, I didn't want that. I was, I was much more interested in a, in a bright child. And I said that to them. I was fairly honest with them. I couldn't believe it was coming out of my mouth. And they said, well, we have lots of kids like that. Um, and sure enough, uh, I kind of forgot that I had been interviewed for it, and I was there for five days. At the end of five days, they said, we have this little girl for you. Would you like to meet her? I said, sure. And I changed my, my plane reservations from 9 o'clock in the morning to noon, and I spent that period of time with her. She didn't speak any English. She was a teeny, weeny little thing. She walked in, and she stuck out her hand, and she said, how do you do? And, and, th that, and thank you very much, and that was all. And, that, and, uh, and then four months later, I saw her again as she got off the plane. How did you feel when you were at the airport and she was coming and you knew she was going to be if your child? If you have never done anything like that, you should do it. It's the most exciting experience in the world. It is, it's like an enormous delivery room at, at an airport. <laughs> and all these parents are waiting there very nervously. And, and they're waiting for a child, a, a little person whom you will know for the rest of your life, hopefully, if nothing happens to them. And, and it was just, it was terribly exciting. I, I can't remember any kind of anticipation that was like that. And yet I can't remember any experience as vividly as I remember that. I mean, I remember all the emotions. I remember all what I was wearing. I remember all of the moments there. And it's just a terribly exciting time. It's really, it's a real tearjerker. It's, it's an incredible experience. Did she remember that she had met you? Oh, yes. Uh, she remembered that I, uh, she said, the thing that she remembers that I had two big eyes and I didn't know whether that was T-W-O or T-O-O, but that I had two big eyes and I had long fingernails and I was much younger than she expected me to be. I, I, mean, I don't know what motherhood was there, but I mean that I was much younger. And uh, that she, she stroked my hair a lot and all those things. But she, she does remember that she met me. She knew, and I sent her pictures, and I sent her pictures of my parents, and I sent her pictures of my sisters and their children. And uh, I have a sister who lives in Baltimore, and I sent her pictures of, of, of um, her children, Phyllis and, and, and Alan and Susie, my nieces and nephews. And, and I have a sister who's just moved to California, and they're her two kids. And, and uh, so it's just... Uh, she was very familiar. When she got off the plane, she knew everybody who was there, and she and she knew. I, I checked the words in Korean with her as we were coming, and she learned the the English words immediately. She knew exactly who the people were. So she was she was great. She's she's always been that way too. She's just a lover. How did the people in your family respond when you first announced? Well, with they had mixed reactions. My father who was just a lovely man, was very supportive from the very beginning. His response was, well, do it. The, if you've, you've always completed the things that you've started, and it's, all, it's been fairly, it hasn't been painful. Um, my mother thought I was out of my mind, and the first thing she said was, do it. If you want to do it, do it but I'm not going to babysit for you. And that's it. She always, uh, she's always calling up and saying, when are the kids coming? But um, my father was very supportive. And without my parents, I don't know what I would have done. They are just fabulous. They are supportive and wonderful and helpful. And my mother is constantly sewing things for the kids and making things for them. My father's constantly building things for them. And when I was in Philadelphia with Lee Hay, 
they were always helpful, always. If I needed any help, they were over there in a minute. And even now, I'm in New York and they're in Philadelphia, my father will hop in the train and come up and, and help me. It, it, I, they're just wonderful people. I, I, I so you feel an extended family is very important, important. in order to do even this? Even in the social, uh, in the home study that was done by the social agency, this was stressed. It was done at my home in Philadelphia, as a matter of fact, in, in my parents' home in Philadelphia. And uh, they thought that it was terribly important. And I agree with, I really do. Uh, my kids feel that Nanny and Papa are their second home. And they're very good about it. How much influence do you think your salary had with the agency? I don't know. I think um, the loving home and desire and all of those things were terribly important. And I think the fact that I had a good job was very helpful too. I, I think that uh, they put all of those things together. I think if a person has all of the things and is missing a good salary, I don't think that would stand in his or her way. Were you able to tell from your interviews with the adoption agency what negative qualities they were looking for? You mean they were trying to avoid? Yeah. I don't know. She asked me, the woman who did my home study asked me some very pointed questions. She asked me about my sex life. And she asked me about, uh, this is not a negative thing, but she asked me if I ever thought in terms of getting married. Um, she asked me about my relationship with my parents, which is also not a negative thing, but she uh, could potentially see that as a problem, and my sisters. And I think they, they are basically looking for a stable situation. I think they're trying to avoid, for the child's sake, anything that would be um, a deviation uh, because it is hard in our society to um, get along uh, with variables that are um, hard to deal with. We, I know why you, know, you did what you did, but do you know other reasons that other single parents have adopted children? Have I looked into it? Yeah. Uh, I, I have not met an awful lot of single parents who have adopted children. I have met virtually a handful. There aren't too many, mm -hmm. as you well know. Um, and the, the reasons vary as much with the people as with the incidents uh, of adoption. I mean, they've all done it for different reasons. It's just, it's uh, one woman I know, I think, did it because she was very lonely, because she was alone. And I think that's a very, if I may put a label on it, which I hesitate to do, I don't think that's a good reason. Uh, although certainly not an unfair reason, I just don't think it's a good reason for the child. Um, one man who adopted, I know, did it because he happened to be uh, bringing back kids from Vietnam and just fell in love with a little boy, and it was really a one-to-one -one kind of thing. Uh, another woman, I know, did it for um, reasons that she just never thought that she was going to get married, and she really wanted children. Uh, it just it varies with with each case. You really, you know, took on something uh, doing first of all the interracial thing, but also adopting a Vietnamese child. I mean, there are going to be problems anyway between a single parent and a child. You know, certain problems. Um, what were some of the problems because she is Vietnamese and because she had lived in that atmosphere? Well, let me first say that adopting Lee Hay could have gotten along in the home of of a, of a rhinoceros. I mean, she could have gotten along Lee in, Korean, is right? the first child. She could have gotten along in anybody's home. She really is just a a wonderfully giving, easy child. She'll just do anything. I mean, she just says, ah, I, I'll never forget the day we were just, we were lying in bed together and she said, Mommy, do you think I could crawl back in you and I could become really yours? I could really become yours? I mean, she just says, wonderful soft kind of kind things you know she just she wants so much to be like me you know, she always asked me she did if, when she grew up her eyes would be like mine you know she just there's so many uh, touching moments with Lee Hay. Lee Hay is just filled with love and giving uh, kindness and and you, you kind of you don't know I didn't know how much of that was Lee Hay and how much of that was our relationship and me I learned when Holly came <laughs> It was it was a very different experience with Holly. Holly was kind of like receiving a letter bomb. She is a darling, lively, sweet, wonderful kid who has lived on the streets for six years. She's a street child. Um, she's uh, stopped lying and she's stopped doing a lot of the things that kids do when they are forced to survive. But she came over as a kid who had seen a lot of very ugly things. She had been found in a trash can as an infant. 
She had been raised by a prostitute. She has, um, she had been extremely physically abused. So she has that kind of personality. She has a very confrontation type personality. She's, she, she's always looking for the, you know, the, she's always testing. She's always trying to, to survive. And she's just learning now that she doesn't have to do that. But it's very hard to live with that. And it's very hard for Lee Hay, who, who was looking forward to a little sister. And this time bomb walks in. And she, she walks around kind of like a buzzsaw all the time. And she has all this energy. She's a lovely, wonderful child. But it was a totally different experience. She came over with worms, which we haven't been able to get rid of. And she, um, I, I, on the Vietnamese didn't tell us a lot about what we were going to expect. That's the happening. agency I went through, this is Holt, is a wonderful agency, but it was brand new in Vietnam. They had just come in there. Holly was one of the first kids to come out with them. And they weren't used to what the, the information they were being given. We weren't told a lot about Holly, in other words. And what happened was that we didn't know she was abused. I wouldn't have known it had I not been writing a book. And the woman with whom I'm collaborating, Ruth Gruber, went over to do the research on the children and, and went to Vietnam and Korea. And she found out some really startling things about the children, which I never would have known. But some of the more obvious things were, it didn't say that she was even persistent. They didn't have to use a pejorative word. They could have just said that she was persistent rather than stubborn or, or, or demanding or whatever. Well, what did all this do to you, though, Marjorie? I mean, all of a sudden, this child arrives, and well, she's a, a bit of a monster. And uh, well, you know, the, the tantrums the didn't last, or the the biting, screaming, yelling, kicking, head on the floor tantrums, uh, banging your head on the floor tantrums, lasted maybe three or four months, and then they started to then they started to um, subside. Another thing, Holly had been placed for adoption once before and sent back because she was so bad. Naughty. <laughs> Determined. Persistent. And my feeling about single adoption and um, the like is that where single parents are very important are, are, f are the taking of children who would not be placed in other homes. And is that the way the adoption agency sees them? I think you know, so. I think so. They're second after a couple who right, wants to Absolutely. Adopt. I think they are. And because of that, my feeling was that as I was going through this, although sometimes it was really very difficult and very lonely sometimes. You must have had second thoughts, too, occasionally. Well, you have second thoughts when you have your own. Right. Um, I, I, it, was, it was an incredible experience. I, I, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel because I knew a lot of this was just because she couldn't express herself. She spoke no English. And, uh, and she was dying to express herself. I knew that this was going to change. I knew that things would improve. Um, did I feel gypped? Sure, at times I felt gypped. Did I, did I feel offended by the whole thing? Sure, at times I did. But it's all working out very nicely. And um, you make things work. I knew that I was getting myself into a situation that was not going to be all roses. Um, and you, And I'm not ashamed of looking for help. When I found out that Holly was as abused as she was, I think that kids should have a chance to have the pain stop as soon as possible. So I sought out help for her, just so that she could talk about, when she started to express herself, that she could talk about the pain and why she was hurting inside and why she was trying to make explosive situations. And you'd be surprised at, the, at what uh, a very skillful psychologist can get out of a child. Did, did you have to get her help ultimately? She's just started, yeah. She's started, she just started in therapy. And, um, and although I can't, it's hard to see the change on a weekly basis, I know that she's feeling better and that, uh, that we're feeling, but that was starting anyway, that was beginning anyway. She was beginning to relate in a family sense. She had never had a family before. She had never, she never sat down to a table before. She never had a meal. She never had a schedule. She had never, uh, had any responsibilities. She was given a lot of things because prostitution was big business for a time. So she had a lot of material things, but she had no love. And, uh, and that's really the worst kind of child you can possibly imagine because she, she wants things. It's, it's been a really interesting experience for me and a challenging one. And, and I think we're, I mean, we're going we're gonna to 
meet that challenge. I mean, I know we all, <laughs> we don't have what a What do choice. you think the psychological advantages and disadvantages are to being the child of a single parent? Are they clear cut Psycho in your mind? Psychological advantages of being the, the child of a single parent. And we're so couple oriented. Well, the, in my case, the child's never seen any acrimony. There's never been any split in the family. Or, um, are there any advantages? Jeez, I, 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 used to, I don't know. I mean, I suspect there must be one or two. Um, they certainly get a chance to meet a lot of men. Uh, Lee Hay says millions. <laughs> Do you separate them from your social life? Do you take them on dates? Um, sure, I do. Lee Hay has uh, asked one of my dates to marry us. She, uh, um, early on, after I told her that I didn't think that that was a very fair question coming from her, um, I take them on dates. We come as a package. The, it's a package deal. I mean, obviously, I go out on dates by myself, but most of the men with whom I would strike up any kind of a serious relationship obviously know this, and most of them react very warmly to the children. They love them. They're uh, they're very nice little girls, and and uh, they've been very very warm and accepting to the idea. I wouldn't honestly get serious with anyone who wasn't obviously. Good. Do you have strong feelings about marriage one way or the other? No. You're not going to talk about it, right? <laughs> I, uh, I'm not fond of the institution, but I think if I found the right person, I would get married. I, um, I haven't so far, but um, I, I wouldn't be surprised, Mom and Dad. I mean, you're if not going to do, do I mean, it. My parents are, are, I think my parents would love to see me get married, but... Um, you I, don't I, feel you have to for oh, their no. mental health. For the kids' mental health? Right. Oh, no. Oh, I think they're, they're, they're just fine. They have a lot of male influence in their life, and my father is a steady male influence, if you're talking in those terms. And um, I don't think, I don't think that, that, that I have to, certainly not for... for I think it would be terrible for, to do it for them. That's something that I really people, think you have to do for yourself, don't you? Well, I think people who are divorced and single parents very often feel that they must, you know, remarry for their children, so their children will either have a mother or a father. Or a mother and a father. Or a mother and a father. <laughs> um, I don't feel that way. Do you have to make very elaborate child care arrangements? I know your, your schedule is horrendous. That's the most difficult part. If I, if I could talk to any one point, that is difficult if any of you out there are thinking in terms of adopting children. I would say that putting the pieces of the puzzle together is absolutely the most difficult part. I take the kids to school in the morning if I'm not doing a morning show and um, then someone picks them up after school and after that um, the babysitter will take them to their princess-like activities <laughs> and then I cook them dinner and from there um, we go on to the evening and do whatever whatever number that we can, and I'm always with them on the weekends. Do you think it's your experiences time. are any different from a, a single parent who is divorced or widowed? I do, definitely, because my children have never known me in any other way. Uh, most people who are uh, recently divorced have the added problems of the guilt that the children feel, thinking that they had something to do with the divorce having seen the fights, the acrimonious situation. Um, of course, the death is another very, very traumatic area where, the, where they've lost a father or a mother, and that's just that's a terrible thing to have to deal with, obviously. And also, my children have never known me as anything other than a working mother, so I haven't all of a sudden made a split with them. I haven't at the age of five or six or seven all of a sudden started to be working mommy, I want you home. Mm -hmm. They've always known me as a working mother. E in each case, I took a couple of weeks off when they came so that I could get them into school and get them into the routine and they knew who was going to pick them up and where they were going to be picked up and they had their little bands and, and tags so they knew if they ever got lost what, uh, what they should do and those kinds of things. Marjorie, we have about two minutes in it and I'd like us to use that time talking about what are the difficult things. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think guilt is the word. I think 
some regretful moments that I couldn't be there more often when some of the really exciting things happen, but I really make sure that I am there as much as I can. I will never miss a play or a recital or anything that I know that's important. I'll never miss a parent day at school. I know that that's, that's an absolute must, and the people for whom I work know that too. The, the difficult moments are the moments when you just would love another person there. You just want somebody else to be there and say, okay, you take it from here. Sometimes it's a lonely experience. Sometimes it's hard to just come home from a day at work with 20 deadlines and you walk in the house and the kids are fighting and you say, okay, guys, mommy's had a hard day today. Can you understand that? Well, they can. They're too young. And it's uh, some, I mean, there are moments when they can, but not when they're arguing and they, and they want me to hear them out. So that sometimes it, sometimes it is Can a you moment. describe in 30 seconds how they describe the situation? Mm. Well, if you ask Lihei what adoption means, she says it means, well, no one will ever take me away. And if... I think if, if, if you ask Holly eventually what it means to her, it means that, that the pain is going to be gone, the pain of living for a six-year-old kid, that she's here and she's receiving a lot of love and people care about her. And that's really a first, I think, for her. And uh, Marjorie, we're out of time. I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that is. I thank you for sharing the experience. Thank you for watching. Good night.